are more than 100 unique styles of beer, each with their own set of ingredients, process, guidelines, history, and experience. If you're a beer lover, an industry leader, or somewhere in between, a better knowledge of beer style will improve your life and your work. Welcome to A Sense of Beer Style, essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. I'm Julia Herz. And I'm Jeremy Storden. We're advanced Cicerones, beer judges, home brewers, and we're excited to guide you through the vast and wonderful world of beer styles. Welcome everyone to yet another Sense of Beer Style, Stylecast, right? We're going to be talking about styles. Hello, Jeremy. Hello. Hello, Julia. And I'm here in my little studio box of a space in uh, Lyons, Colorado today. And Jeremy is in his box I'm of a space. I'm in my mega million dollar studio. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, but we deliver, Jeremy. We've been consistent. We're already in the um, strong Belgian ales, right? We've made our way. If you This is your first show. Go back and listen to the others. You don't always have to have a beer, but you should. And you can watch us, listen to us. And we're just glad you're here. I'm glad we're here. And boy, are we about to talk about one of my favorite beer styles, Belgian Golden Strong Ale from the Beer Judge Certification Program 2021 Guidelines. And this little beauty cutie, right, is one of those beers that over the history of my beer journey, I've seen so many beer heroes of mine refer to this beer, bring up this beer, hold and drink this beer, buy me this beer, talk to me about this beer. So Belgian Golden Strong Ale which has definitely, you know, um, commercial example styles that are, are somewhat different. It's one of those that created brewers' um, desires to start breweries and and the like. And what I want to do is 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 ground us. Obviously, it's a Belgian beer. Obviously, it's an ale. So that's really good. The Golden Strong, I think, is a fair description. Strong means a little bit higher in alcohol, right? Still not of wine or most wine levels, but getting stronger. So I think the way this style, compared to so many other styles, is described is very helpful to your beer study and recognition and recall of it because every word in Belgian Golden Strong Ale tells you something key about the beer. And so basically... It's highly attenuated. There's some dry and refreshing factor. There's definitely alcohol and ethanol. It is pale or golden, right? You've got this really, really um, clean sense from the malt that's fermented with it, the Pilsner malt. And you've got characteristics of um, Belgian ale yeast. And and so the style historically came to be, just like when, when we did the episode on a uh, Belgian Blonde and, and the Belgian Blonde Ales were created by the Belgians to compete with the English Pale Ales of the day. We have our Belgian Golden Strong. It was literally com- uh, created by the Belgians and Duval Mortgat, uh in Belgium to compete with the Pilsners of the day. And so Belgium, the great beer country that's taught so many new world brewers the old world tricks, they themselves were looking at England and saying how we compete or Germany and how do we compete because Germany had these Pilsners and England had these, these um, pale ales. And so I just love, though, that they kind of showed them all. Because if I were to go to one beer style for a Pilsner, it's not going to be that hoppy Pilsner that I, I love any day of the week. If I had to choi- choose on a desert island, it would be a Belgian Golden Strong. It would. Absolutely. And and if, if I, I'm just going to share another story, if that's okay. But You go while I'm opening up my example. While you open up your example, um, anyone who's listened or watched this enough times knows what I'm about to say. This is one of my favorite beer styles. But what I mean by that is that I love all the beer styles. They're all my favorites. But if I had to pull like a top 10 or top 12, this is in the, in, in the top 10 for me. Um, this is one of the beers. And in my, my criterion for getting into my top 10, top 12 favorite list is, the, is it has to be one of those beers that one day I had the clouds parted and the angels sang, and and this is one of those beers. In fact, the Duval that you that you're showing is that beer that was one of my experiences where the clouds parted and the angels sang. I happened to be in a hotel in Madrid. I got a, a, f- a fresh example because we're a lot closer to Belgium in Madrid than we were in the U.S. And I opened it up in the hotel room, poured it in the glass. I poured it very aggressively to really get the volatiles and the foam 
And, and I was absolutely mesmerized by just the aroma that was coming out of the class and uh, the glass and the flavor and everything. And it was just, it, it was such a profound experience that I had to go home and you'll be proud of me, Julia. I, I brewed it myself. Uh, I brewed this. This is one of my favorite beers to brew. Um, I've, I've actually turned this into a Zabayoni sauce for dessert. It, and and it, there's so many things you can do with this beer. And yes, it's so yes. wonderful. Uh, and especially if you don't let it get as strong as it can be, it's still just absolutely wonderful. Um, but with that, with this incredible beer, let's talk about the ingredients. It's actually really simple to brew. Uh, and so for those of you who are home brewers, those of you who are commercial brewers, please go brew this. Please put this on. This is a fantastic beer style, especially as it gets warmer. Yes, it's strong, but it's light and easy drinking. Uh, so we're going to start with a Pilsner malt base. We're going to use and we're going to use some sugar adjuncts. In fact, uh, a lot of times they'll use a Belgian candy sugar. And you know what? That's also really easy to make at home. And I urge you to try it. I've done it a bunch of times and it's easy. It's wonderful. And it's a great way to really make your own beer. But they're using Pilsner malt. They're using sugar adjuncts. They're using continental hops uh, typically. And what I mean by continental hops is the European continent. So really they're getting into a, a German um, or a Czech noble hops or maybe even British hops. That, that's what they mean by continental. Both of those are okay. And then, of course, we're using this, the wonderful Belgian yeast. They're typically fermenting that at warmer temperatures, maybe upwards of like 80 degrees to really get that ester production, get that uh, phenol production. Uh, and, and then with that combined with some fairly soft water, then you have just this beautiful, uh, I call it the BGS, the Belgian Golden Strong. Um, there's a note here in, in the BJCP that spices, adding spices is not traditional. You don't need them. You've got those esters, you've got those phenols, and it's just incredible. But I'm done talking about ingredients. Let's talk about what that beer looks like in your hand. And and look, if you are watching on YouTube, the 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 collar of foam and head retention is off oh the charts. My. It's it's incredible. You could fall asleep in it's this like take a nap. It, it is like meringue, and it's it's a cloud of meringue. And and yet the color, which is golden, right? That's part of the name. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a little haze that's allowed. They, they, they say it normally for appearance would have good clarity. I would call this hazier. Um, but then Duval actually, even though it helped establish the style, is higher in alcohol than the style guidelines call for, and it's more hazy. Um, but mm -hmm. who cares? I would I don't care. Um, so you're looking for a pale yellow to golden color and good clarity generally. Having it be effervescent is obviously key. You can see fast rising bubbles coming from the bottom in the nucleation sites from my Tiku Tulip Cup. And, you know, you've got, it says, massive, long lasting, rocky, white collar of foam. Look at that as I pour it. I mean, that is incredible. It is, again, let's take a nap on this and, and just sleep in the clouds as we look at it. Mm -hmm. um, this will slowly collapse. And it needs to collapse faster so I can get to a better sip. That's frustrating. Damn it. <laughs> yes, so if, yeah. if I, you know, you've seen bartenders, maybe you could take a knife and just shave that off and flick it into the air for effect. That would be mm -hmm. beautiful poetry in motion. Um, if you're desperate, you can stick your finger into that foam and it will collapse from the oils of your fingers. Pro tip, everyone. Um, but last but not least, I've got it in a beautiful glass. We will certainly talk more in depth about glassware, but the glass is also helping support that collar of foam. So normally I don't think it would be as aggressive, um, but boy, is this a pretty, pretty beer. Yeah. And just a couple tips that, you know, if you're a baker, we're talking stiff peaks. This is the type of foam that you get out of it. It just, it just has so much structure to it. It's incredible. I think one on one little note from from what I've done with with pouring the stuff is if you use a very careful pour, you can make it as clear as, as you humanly can. Um, and you don't have to get what's at the bottom. There might be sediment at the bottom of that bottle. And if that goes in the glass, it will be slightly hazy. If you if you stop pouring before that goes in the glass, then it'll be slightly clearer. So so uh, power to the people on that one. But as you're looking at that, I'm thinking about what I what I love about this, and it and really it's the aroma. Aroma is everything uh, to this stuff. But the you know I always start with malt, start with malt first. It's a very kind of neutral, grainy, sweet. Uh, you know, it kind of conjures um, maybe water crackers, maybe uh, 
biscuits w- without without the butter, but maybe just a very light drizzle, very pale honey uh, at at the most. But but that malt just really serves as a foundation. It's a very low aspect to this flavor. It's just the foundation to, uh, just to kind of prop everything else up. And what's going to be shooting out of that proper glass are going to be just the esters. The esters are coming out and we're talking about pears, orange, lemon, apples, uh, just the, those aroma notes that are just tickling your fancy are, are going to be the most pronounced. And then right behind that, you're going to get this, uh, I'm sorry, the esters are going to be medium to high. That's how pronounced they are. Uh, with the phenols, those are low to moderate. We're looking at not spiciness. It's not spicy as in hot, but the spice, the spice like maybe pepper, maybe allspice, um, maybe a touch of clove, but I don't really get that. But I've heard people say that it reminds them of clove. But you have that just kind of follow up to add complexity to all that fruit. And then these are quite strong. So having a low to moderate alcohol uh, come through is is typical. But that alcohol is going to be, now that is can be a little bit spicy. Oftentimes I get notes of peppermint. Uh, some people describe it as being uh, perfumey or floral uh, just from the, the alcohol alone. And then we're also, there's also some hops in there. It's not a hop forward beer really, uh, but you can get some of those continental hops. It could, if it's a British style hop, it'll be a little bit more uh, earthy and tea-like. If it's more of a German style, then it's going to be a little bit more uh, garden and herbal uh, or maybe even perfumey. But what we should not get out of this is something that's harsh. It shouldn't be solventy. It shouldn't, it shouldn't smell like a, a cleanser or anything uh, overly aggressive. This is ironically, even though it can be quite strong, is so easy drinking and inviting and and wonderful. So it, it should not be aggressive or difficult. So that's aroma. How about flavor? Okay, here we go. So flavor, and I've been I'm sipping it and tasting it, and and this is one of those beers where the style guidelines literally say carrying over from the aroma, <laughs> right? And then they list it, right? What aroma esters, said? <laughs> it, it, yeah, exactly. What aroma said for esters, hops, malts, phenols, and alcohol. That's a big list. So you just carry over what Jeremy said, and you're going to find that falling into the flavor after you take your um, first kind of whiff and sniff, which is beautiful. Um, You are going to get the uh, true notion of what a palm fruit tastes like, right? Something that has a core, apples, pears. I remember my first um, example of a Belgian Golden Strong, and I was blown away by the fact that it actually taught me what a pear smells like when you just cut it, right? And, And that's that esters, those pear esters. So that's a big aspect of the flavor of the beer and it and it carries over from the aroma. You're also looking for and it's kind of surprising a more discerning bitterness, right? This beer is actually a bitter beer. We'll save it for the IBUs to kind of let you know um in the numbers in a minute when we go over vital stats, but the bitterness on some examples is is discerning. And a great way, I've talked about this just in a few shows, so I'll bring it up again cuz it's a great trick. To really know the bitterness of a beer without the residual sugar balancing it, because sugar balances bitter, is because there's such a stable color of foam, you take that foam on your pinky and you taste it. And it is so much more sharply bitter. Then as soon as I drink it, that residual sugar does what it's supposed to do and balances Mm -hmm. with the bitterness, but it shows you how bitter it is. So I encourage you to do that test, because if you're tasting this against a Belgian triple which is similar and we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. It's le- it's 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 more bitter. So great aspect to remember of Belgian Golden Strongs is those esters, those hops, the the pilsner malt, the phenols and and the alcohol and then also the uh, bitterness. Um, also in flavor you're going to get kind of that dry finish even though the final gravity can be higher above 1010 all the way up to 1016. Um, But that dry aspect of it to me is truly an element that sets it apart. And, um, and I think flavor wise, we, we've covered it minus mouthfeel, but it is as you, as we work our way through now, um, the story unfolds and continues. It is, it is an incredible, incredible beer. And so why don't you tidy this all up in a nice little bow with the mouthfeel? 
with mouthfeel. And, and as you as you would expect, uh, as we we're learning with the Belgian styles, the characteristic that that uh, is common to the vast majority of Belgian styles is that they are lower in body and, and stronger and higher in alcohol. And that's part of that attenuation. The yeast, the Belgian yeast really do their job well. And so this is par for the course. It's a light to, to medium body at, at best. And I have had some examples that are a little bit medium body, a little bit darker in color and, and having some residual sugars. Uh, they were absolutely delicious. But the bullseye of this style really is, and we'll talk about this later, like the del uh, delirium tremens, the duval. And so that's the that's kind of the standard that everything is is measured by. And they are light to medium body. You've got very, very high carbonation with these. Again, typical of, of Belgian styles. It takes all that flavor. Enjoy that flavor. Enjoy that finish. Scrubs your palate clean. And you get to start all over and, and enjoy it once again, uh, like, like the first time ever. Um, but we're also, we're typically going to notice that alcohol warmth. You can feel it on your palate. It just feels warm and just kind of tingly, but it should be smooth. It should be inviting. It should be enjoyable. It should never be harsh. It should never be solventy or aggressive. This is a beer that invites a sip after sip after sip. That's mouthfeel. Let's talk about uh, how what this compares to. Great. So I kind of brought up Belgian triple, and these two are cousins, if not brother sisters, and yeah. you know beers from another mista kind of thing. <laughs> I think um, the Belgian triple is sweeter, uh, or I know it is, and um, from experience, I, I think that's just a choice, right? Do you want something drier or sweeter? And then you kind of know where you would tip for this. Um, the yeast and that ester and the flavor development uh, is much more pronounced on the uh, Belgian Golden Strong than the triples. The triples are more moderated on the yeast profile, in my view. And so that's kind of it. The style guidelines talk about has more of a late hopping character. I don't know. Either I'm not getting fresh enough examples or just I've never noticed that as a trend. Um, but you what you will do yourself a wonderful afternoon and sensory session if you set up you set yourself up with a couple of triples, a couple of Belgian golden strongs, mark them, blind taste them, and discover how well you were able to discern the differences. Well, and and I've got a little key. I, I was extremely fortunate. One one of the reasons why I wanted to create this show is because I got to learn all about the BJCP styles. I went through each and every substyle twice with a level four BJCP master judge, my one of my beer mentors, Randy Scorby. And um, and because not everyone got to sit with a beer mentor of that caliber to go through this stuff, that's why I wanted to create uh, this this uh, podcast, the Stylecast. But one of the things he told me about these two, and, and th this this is a comparison, the triple and the, and the BGS, that I think any advanced or master Cicerone would would just it, it would still pose a problem to even the most sensitive palates. It's challenging. And what what my mentor, the master beer judge, told me that that I always hang on to, for the most part, Belgian Golden Strongs are more ester driven. Belgian triples are more phenol driven. And I appreciate and, that correction. Actually, I, I love it. I love it. Well, and, and that wasn't meant to correct you. That was meant to supplement what you're saying. But I, I like to whittle things down into, into simple terms. And for me, if I've got two side by side, I would expect the BGS to be more estuary and the triple to be a little bit more phenolic. And and I think you're not trying to correct. But what I like is, and, and our job is to guide you, the listener, along with us as yeah. we all try to retain in our beer studies a better, deeper understanding of styles. I was kind of big picturing it, right? Saying the Belgian Golden Strong is is more emphasis on the yeast kind of byproduct notes, and that's a that's a high level yeah, yeah. view, right? You're saying yeah. Belgian Golden Strong, and now I'll remember it is more ester driven, and I totally get it. It goes back to the palm fruit. Just think fruit esters. There's your yeah. Belgian Golden Strong, and then triple more phenol driven. Totally, totally see that. Get it. Appreciate that tip for me and our listeners. Awesome. Well, uh, you want to talk about, uh, actually, I'll talk about the commercial examples. Uh, yeah. Julia, you have one, uh, the the classic, the icon uh, is Duval. Uh, it, and they're 
luckily very easy to find. Go find a Duval, try it and enjoy it. Another one that is also, uh, from my experience, very easy to find, a Delirium Tremens uh, with the pink elephants on it. That's another fantastic uh, example of it. There's lots of great uh, craft breweries that make fantastic examples. Uh, I think Victory is one of them that I, I just I just love that beer. But one of the things that you'll notice is because of the history of this beer, which uh, only became a light colored beer uh, in the 70s. Before that, it was a dark colored beer, but it was so strong that um, the initial reaction was this must be from the devil. Right. And so a lot of these names are, are kind of going along with that. Duval uh, means uh, devil in Flemish. Uh, another versions are Lucifer or Judas. Um, uh, Russian River uh, has makes one named Damnation. And so there's a little bit of a naming um, kind of trend, uh, kind of paying homage to its roots and history. So uh, that will give you a tip to find something. And of course, uh, you know, if you're a brewer, they're, these are fairly easy to brew and really enjoyable. So I dare you to go brew it. But those are commercial examples. How about uh, some numbers? So number wise, we've got a range that is somewhat similar in the original gravity and ABV, mostly and helpful to remember, um, 1070 for original gravity to 1095. That's actually a higher original gravity. Um, that brings you to an ABV of seven and a half to ten and a half. There, there's some connection there between the numbers, right? It's funny because my Duval Jeremy is eleven point two percent. So as one of the classic styles, it's it's higher in alcohol than the style guidelines yeah. even get at, yeah. which is fascinating. And then final gravity is ten oh five to ten sixteen. Now that gets at that much drier range. Ten oh five is definitely dry beer. Ten sixteen has some residual sugar. Yeah. So it just depends on the commercial example that you're getting to. And international bitterness units randomly, and I'd love to see if this this is not scientifically um, backed. That's one of the things about all the style guidelines that you come across. And then they'll fluctuate over the years. So what the heck is up with 22 BUs? That's got to be from one commercial example, maybe, that BJCP is identifying. 22 bitterness units to 35 bitterness units is the range. 35 is getting more discernibly bitter in such a pale, not, um, you know, junked up with a lot of different kinds of malt you're going to get that bitterness up in the 35 range. And then SRM or standard reference method is three to six. So just think pale yellow to gold, you know, pale straw to um, golden color. Gold is usually five SRM. Six is like a darker gold. And so I, I love that. It's very tight, three to six, easy to remember numbers, three plus three is six. And so there you have it, minus any conversions that Jeremy always is wanting to throw in and is fine to do. Well, because I, I want to give love to the the non U.S. brewers and beer uh, sobs that are out there, and so for those of you who are in European brewery convention land, as far as color goes, you know it really is simple. Just double the SRM is six to twelve, or if you're in the U.S., then you know uh, divide by two for the EBC, and you've got the SRM uh, for the the gravities. If you're a original Plato type of person, again, this is a stronger beer. We're starting from 17 and a half up to 23 and a half. And that, that final Plato, after it's done attenuating down, then we're looking at one and a half to four. And for your overall Plato in terms of amount of alcohol, we're looking at about 16 to 19 and a half, give or take. Um, and, and that those are the conversions there. Uh, well but when we're, but thank you. But when we're looking at glasses, um, you know, honestly, uh, these beers are coming from Belgium, then they're typically going to have their own stylized glass. Uh, and that's part of the marketing. That's part of the charm. Uh, this is, uh, you know, frankly, this is a really sexy beer to me. And so it's nice to have a nice glass to kind of dress it up and have a nice little occasion, a nice little, nice little dinner out. Um, but really, uh, for a glass or a, for a beer like this, I want I want a nice glass. I'm not going to lie. Uh, you know, I want a stemmed tulip. I want because uh, I want to control whether I hold it from the stem if it's just right, or hold it by the bowl if it's too cold. Uh, and and it, that just helps prop up that beautiful foam. Everything is wonderful about it. I, I would prefer it in that glass because of that foam experience. But I wouldn't shake uh, a stick at someone putting it into a goblet or a chalice or anything like that either. I, I would expect that to be a fairly normal. But I'm going to uh, chime in too, real quick, yeah. um, to add contribute to the pool of knowledge. 
where it's so carbonated, a lot of Belgian styles and, and a few Germans, some of the Weizen beers, can be above 3.3 3 volumes of CO2, not 3 point, forgive me, 3 volumes of CO2 or more. That is a lot of carbonation. And, you know, we could do a whole prep episode and we should. The list is long on what's mm-hmm. the point of carbonation in beer. Um, and one of those things is that refreshment factor. But when you drink it out of the bottle or the can, the beverage, your body, you you are retaining more of that carbonation. This beer, I would be hard pressed to see. So I bet less than 25% at least of people that drink this beer, drink it out of the bottle, right? You, you can't necessarily say that. A lot of styles, people drink it out of the bottle or the can. This one you want to pour into the glass because you're going to ingest less CO2. You're going to ingest less carbonation. You're going to fill up less and you're going to go to that second or third beer more easily because you did that. And, and to add to that point, one, one, one of the things I want to suggest with this, because it is such high carbonation, don't pour it the usual way for experiment with this. Don't pour it gently down the side and then uh, the glass and then turn it up right to get a little bit of foam. I challenge you, if you're listening, try this at least once. Take that bottle or that can and pour it aggressively down the center of the glass and let that carbonation completely disperse. You're going to build a ton of foam. You're going to have to stop mid pour and you're going to have to wait and you're going to have to wait and you're going to have to wait. And when that foam eventually dies down, then pour the rest of it in there and try, try that. This is a perfect beer for that aggressive pouring style to release the excess CO2. I'm, and, I and, love it. And and I, I'm saying from this experience today of, of pouring my Duval, A, I'm going to guess, I can't say it definitively, that they're bottle conditioned. And because there's enough yeast sediment in this, that I was a little sloppy in my beginning advanced Cicerone pour, bad on Julia, right? It was cloudier than it should have been. And then my last pour literally got enough yeast in there where the flavor profiles changed. It's more bubble gummy now. I'm getting mm. a little sense of chalk or milk of magnesia, right? I'm getting those kind of vitamins and minerals that normally would just, you would leave that little last like quarter of an ounce, mm. eighth of an ounce behind. And and so pouring that yeast in is a good experiment because if you have one beer that you do that to, and then you have a second bottle or can and do that, you're going to see what happens. You're going to notice the difference. And the yeast is definitely going to influence not just the appearance, but the flavor. Yeah. Uh, And last thing before we go on to my favorite food pairing, uh, as far as temperature, Uh, this is a, you know, my rule of thumb is the darker and stronger, the warmer it should be, the the lighter and weaker, the colder it should be. Um, This is a little bit of a challenge because it's both stronger and lighter. Uh, Frankly, this is a refreshing delicious beer. Yes, it's strong. It's going to knock you on your butt if you try and have too many, but it's still refreshing and delightful and easy drinking. I want to have this in the ballpark of 42 degrees Fahrenheit or six degrees Celsius because I want it chilled, but I don't want it ice cold. Never, never, never ice cold. It's got too much flavor expression. Yeah. So let's let's go to food. Okay. Food. Um, what a food beer, so many of the Belgian beers, I mean, any Belgian beer style, you're going to have such great foods to choose from because of the flavor profiles, not just the malt and the hops, but the yeast expression. Um, I always go to craftbeer.com, which I definitely helped contribute. I was publisher of it, helped create that website still alive today. Um, and what we have listed and it's just, it, it covers all bases, beer battered fried shrimp triple cream cheese, and baklava. Let's talk about baklava. Oh. This beer, I was going to interrupt Jeremy earlier when he was talking aroma, and I didn't even remember to say it while I had the stage and floor during flavor. The beer itself tastes like something like a like a, a, a freshly cut plum that's drizzled with honey, right? And that's baklava. Right, you've got these layers of of phyllo dough, very delicate dough. That's your Pilsner malt. Then they're drizzled with honey. They have kind of uh, you know chopped up nuts in there and this and that. Baklava all the way, and then triple cream cheese. My goodness, if you do partake in cheese, um, God love you because I do too. And triple cream is different than brie. It's much richer, denser. Let it get melty. Let it get gooey. And the essence of that pretty mild rind. I want you to eat the rind with your triple cream while you drink your Duval and get back to us and tell you how you liked it. And then just try the triple cream with the Duval. 
It's going to be a different experience. Often eating the cheese rind will take things up a notch or make you run or run and hide. We'll see. Let us know what you think. A beer bottled fried shrimp, just anything fried and lightly breaded, right? And shrimp is such a non-fishy seafood, right? It's got such a great clean flavor. Shrimp doesn't go all the way to the lobster. It doesn't go all the way to, to, to crab. But shrimp has umami. Umami to the table with a beer like this that's so delicate, I think is going to um, get potentiate, potentiated even more by the carbonation. And it is going to help that shrimp pop. And then that Pilsner malt's going to fall into the breading on that shrimp. And you're going to love it. I would say say as soon as you go to that horseradish sauce and cocktail sauce, it's probably going to be a clash, though. So you just test. Let us know what you think. What about you, Jeremy? For me, uh, you know, I'm going to agree with you. I I, I love this with fish, uh, but, you know, you have this wonderful carbonation. It's almost champagne like. So I want to really take advantage of that. Plus that refreshing flavor uh, contrast with some of the food. Uh, You know, I think about. I have uh, experiences of of having like a, a really steaky predator type of fish, uh, like swordfish or even shark. Um, th- this this beer would be f- phenomenal with those. Uh, I love making um, a, a, a rustic uh, mushroom risotto, and this would be a beautiful contrast and palate scrubber. Um, and then you know, not far from Italy, I go to Spain, and, I'm, and I want to have a good seafood paella. This would take those those uh, flavor notes that you get with paella and have this add this fruit flavor to it and have this uh, palate scrubber. And then I want to finish, and I've actually done this, Julia, uh, and it, it turned out great. Uh, the, the Italian Zabaioni sauce is typically made with a sweet wine. Why not try it with beer? And I have, and it was wonderful. It's just like egg, sugar, and some little bit of beer, and you mix it up until it's really thick, and, and then pour that over berries with some shortbread cookies. And when you have that inherent Belgian golden strong flavor in that mix. It is extraordinary. And I urge you to try it. You go, you go. And, and, and look, look how long a show we did. We normally try a half hour or less (laughs) on such a simple beer, right? It's an easier to brew beer. You want a softer, softer water profile, Pilsner malt, Belgian um, ale yeast, and you're off and running. Like this is the example of how simplicity in beer can be so complex. It's, it's an incredible style. I, I would just say happy, happy listening again or watching and um, keep drinking and buying this, this style of beer and, and brewing it as well. And I think I need to go find one, crack it open because now I can't stop thinking about it. So cheers, everyone. I'll see you next time. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Essence of Beer Style, the essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. With advanced Cicerones, me, Julia. And me, Jeremy. Tune into the next episode as we continue exploring the world of beer styles and what to make of them. We encourage you to listen to the prepisodes to build your foundation and better understand beer styles. And before the next episode, I'd like to ask you to review the show and let us know what you'd like featured in upcoming episodes. Until next time, here's to you and your sense of beer style. Thank you for listening. Cheers. Cheers.